Our brother Phil was kind enough to let me know well in advance of today that he would not be available to provide any visual aids in support of my talk this morning. Therefore, I brought with me this morning instead a prop. This prop will serve as my visual aid. This is a hat that I had made up, and from that distance you may not be able to make that out, but that is a Star of David, and above and within the Star of David it reads, for the hope of Israel, I am bound. That quote is taken from some of Paul's last recorded words in Acts 28:20. 20. To me, this hat serves kind of like the teflon that adult Jewish males hang before their eyes to keep God's word before them at all times. And this hat will serve me to keep the hope that God has provided me before my eyes. And I must say that it is quite effective. If you were to wear this hat in public, I will tell you that you had better be prepared to always give an answer for the hope that is within you, <laughs> especially if you wear it in the wrong location. <laughs> so. Now they say that necessity is the mother of invention, but necessity can also give birth to learning. This morning's subject Fanning the Flames of Hope was born out of my personal necessity to strengthen my understanding of the one hope of our calling. And I hope today that this talk will help to fan and strengthen your hope as well. Because prior to this study, I had sometimes felt it dogmatic to say to someone, as Paul says in Ephesians, that there is only one hope, one faith of your calling. But after looking further into the subject of biblical hope, I no longer feel this way. In today's reading of Psalm 100, the psalmist declares in verse 3, Know ye that Yahweh, he is God. It is he that made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. It is clear that the psalmist is obviously not deliberating in his mind whether we ourselves or whether God physically created ourselves, the human race. This is not in question in the psalmist's mind. The Hebrew word rendered people is am, am, Strong's 5971, meaning a community of people having a common association. When we look to the Old Testament Hebrew words most often rendered as hope, we see that the one hope of our calling, that this one hope was, is, and will remain at the core of God's intended design, formulated from the very foundation of creation, God's method to call out, to gather, and to bind a separate people together, having something in common, that something is the one hope of our calling. The two Hebrew words most often rendered as hope in the Old Testament are mikveh, Strong's 4723, meaning confident expectation, and tikvah, Strong's 8615, meaning literally, literally a cord or rope to bind together. Both of these words, mikveh, and tikvah come from the Hebrew root word korvah, meaning to gather together by intertwining. Korvah first appears in the creation account itself in Genesis 1.9. Let the waters under heaven be gathered, korvah, into one place, that the dry land appear, that the dry land, a place for God's people, that our pasture for his sheep appear. As Paul would write to Titus in Titus chapter 1, verse 2, in the hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. And Paul goes on further to say in Romans 8, verse 20, for the creation was subjected to vanity, not of its own will, but by reason of him who subjected it in hope that it be delivered into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Tikvah, meaning literally a cord, first appears in Joshua 2.18. As the scarlet thread, tikvah, 
in the hands of Rahab, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread that thou didst let us down by in thy window and gather thy people into the household that death may pass thee by, having clear symmetry with the Passover. In the New Testament, the Greek word always rendered as hope is elpis, meaning to anticipate with confidence. For the hope of Israel, says Paul, I am bound with this chain, this scarlet thread, which began in the hands of Rahab, has now down through the ages become an unbreakable chain in the hands of Paul. Paul, who for the certainty of this hope was bound to preach the gospel and suffered for it. From the foundation of creation itself, God intended by design to fulfill his purpose by gathering a people having a common association. And essential to this common association, God gave his people evidence of a hope as a cord or scarlet lifeline to cleave onto to sustain his newly begotten people. Ye are my witnesses, says Isaiah, ye are my witnesses to this evidence that I have provided. From this study of biblical hope, I have come to understand that there is in this lifetime two different types of certainties that bind all people everywhere together. The first, there are absolute certainties that bind all physical creation, all peoples everywhere together. For instance, the laws of physics. These are absolute certainties. A body in motion will tend to stay in motion. These laws of physics have been proven to be absolutely always certain. And all peoples everywhere are bound together by these absolute laws of nature. In addition, there are also in this lifetime mathematical certainties that are absolute and that we are all bound by. Two plus two will always equal four. That is absolutely certain in our current physical state. These are absolute certainties that all creation is bound together by in this lifetime that we cannot escape. But from this study, I've also found that there are moral certainties as well that can bind a people together as having something in common. Moral certainties are not absolute. They are certainties, convictions, arrived at based upon the preponderance of evidence provided. A certainty arrived at based upon the preponderance of evidence which requires of us a moral or ethical response to rightly divide the evidence provided and to reach a righteous conviction. A jury, for instance, has the moral ethical, ethical obligation to first weigh all the evidence and then render a righteous verdict. Ye are my witnesses to this evidence of the hope which I have provided you, that you may know and believe me, says God. God has created all mankind, all peoples everywhere in his image, all having in common the mental capacity of reasoning. And by his design, has shown himself by many infallible proofs within his written word to call out and separate a people from among them, the sheep of his pasture, who will hear his voice and use their God-given mental capacity of reasoning to weigh the preponderance of evidence he has provided and morally respond to these many infallible proofs within his written word. A people who cannot just see a burning bush which is not consumed and walk away from it to continue about their lives unchanged, but must turn, investigate, and weigh the preponderance of evidence to create a separate people bound together by conviction and hope. Hope is the moral certainty, the conviction to honor his word as true and his promises certain. More precious than gold tried in the fire is this, says Peter, to conclude of our own volition as a free will offering of praise, honor, and thanksgiving. 
To honor God's word as true, as a moral certainty, David says in Psalm 138, All the kings of the earth shall give thee thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of thy mouth. And Isaiah 42 says, It pleased the Lord for his righteousness sake to magnify the law, to make the Torah, to make his teaching great and glorious and honorable. This morning, to amplify the import and preciousness of honoring God's word as true and certain of our own volition, let us for just a moment consider the only absolute certainty that God himself is bound by. For God has shown us that he, unlike us, is not absolutely always bound by the laws of physics as we are. When he made the axe head to float or the fleece to be wet one morning and, the, and the, to be dry the next morning, he has shown us that he, unlike us, is not absolutely always bound by the laws of mathematics. When the children of Israel were made to wander for 40 years, yet their shoes were not out. Hanukkah is a celebration that commemorates that God is not always bound by the laws of mass, math, mathematics as we are. And, of course, we can go to many examples. Certainly the case of feeding 5,000 with five loaves of bread. But God, God does want us to be his witnesses to know, believe, and understand the one absolute that God cannot deny is himself. And the one absolute he cannot defy is his word. For God cannot lie, as our dear brother Richard so often reminds us. God cannot deny himself, and he cannot defy his word. This is God's righteousness. And to know, believe, and understand this is God's righteousness extended to us. This hope, this moral certainty based on the evidence provided, we have as an anchor to our souls, to cleave onto as an unbreakable scarlet lifeline, to hold us together as a people, anchored, planted beside the streams of living water, says both David and Jeremiah. Planted in such a way that we be not easily tossed about the winds and waves roaring around us and every wind of doctrine swirling about us. The hope of the resurrection, the hope of eternal life, the hope of Israel, says Paul to Titus, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. These are not merely things we wish for or would like to see happen. These are specified promises of God that have become events certain to us based on the evidence the Bible has provided us. Biblical hope is not only a verb, something we wish for, which emanates from us. Biblical hope is also a noun, something the Bible has provided to us. The substance of things hoped for, a promised thing, an event certain, that we are convinced of based on the evidence. Biblical hope is synonymous with faith and trust in God and honoring his word as true, certain, and absolute. And we have been begotten again, says Peter, unto a living hope. This hope is not passive. It provides a lifeline, a scarlet thread to cleave onto as an unbreakable chain to anchor our souls to become a people bound together, all by the intended design of God, which he promised before the world began. Biblical hope, this moral certainty, gives us patience and perseverance, as Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8. For by hope were we saved. For hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopeth for what he seeth? But if we hope for what we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. With patience, we eagerly wait for what has become an event certain to us. Hope changes our perspective. A people who see this life as a temporary sojourn, as Peter tells us. Beloved, I beseech you as sojourners and pilgrims to abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your behavior seemly among the Gentiles. This moral certainty changes what we value setting our affections on things above and not below. As our Lord himself instructs us, 
to lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust, rust doth consume. For where your treasure is, there will thy heart be also. The hope, this hope in us is it affects what we do with our lives, our talents, time, our treasure, as John instructs us. Beloved, now are we children of God, and it is not yet manifest what we will be. We know that when, we sh when he shall appear, we shall be like him. And every man having this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Hope gives us joy and peace. Romans 15. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope and the power of the Holy Spirit. It provides God's protection. Psalm 33. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon those who fear him, upon those who hope in his mercy. And it grants us strength, courage, and boldness. Psalm 31. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all ye who hope in the Lord. And it provides endurance, comfort, confidence, even in the face of death. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them that fall asleep, that you sorrow not even as those who have no hope. For if we believe Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which fall asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. If I may, brothers and sisters, go off script for just a moment. As a side note, we often hear, announced each Sunday, the list of brethren and sisters who are suffering with various afflictions. And we can sometimes wonder how can we help and what can we do to encourage and what should we pray for. But certainly on that list would be that they never lose their hope. For lastly, our hope shall be satisfied. These specified promises shall be fulfilled suddenly. In the twinkling of an eye, as lightning comes from the east and shineth even unto the west, which is why this table exhorts us to eat this Passover meal each week in haste, with our loins girded, our shoes on, our staff in hand, ready and waiting our lanterns filled with confident expectation. For in an hour you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Brothers and sisters, these, all these blessings and gifts associated with biblical hope brought me to wonder and to think upon the tradition behind the idea of the hope chest. The tradition of giving the bride a hope chest prior to marriage. And why did they call it a hope chest? As tradition would have it, when the courting period had ended and the official, the official engagement made known, when it became clear and apparent, when all the evidence indicated that there would be soon a marriage, upon this moral certainty, the parents, friends, and relatives would begin contributing as gifts to the bride all the essential items to prepare her for her new life and deposit them into a wooden chest they called a hope chest. Perhaps, brothers and sisters, we are God's hope chest, written upon the tablets of our hearts. We each having courted with the word in our former days, and each of us having now determined with moral certainty its absolute truth. We have each morally responded to the preponderance of evidence within the pages of scripture with our baptisms our official engagement to our Lord, the Word made flesh, with all the signs pointing out toward a soon-to-be marriage, that during this period of, of our engagement and interaction with the Word, honoring God's Word as absolute, that during this time of our engagement, the Word would develop and mature within us, that God grant unto us all the essential gifts we will need for our new life, faith, hope, and love. And now, brothers and sisters, as we, as a people created by God and not we ourselves, called by the one hope of our calling, which he promised before the world began, let us come to the focal point of our gathering today, 
With this same moral certainty we gain each day from the many infallible proofs shown to us unfolding upon the world stage. Let us with the same certainty look back in time to remember our Lord now, his sacrifice and all this table represents. Coming before his presence, making a joyful noise, singing hymns of praise, serving the Lord with gladness, appreciating that it is he who called us by hope as the sheep of his pasture, this pasture, this dry land created from the very foundation of creation itself, called by the one hope of our calling, a scarlet thread, this unbreakable chain, the hope of Israel. Let us each now eat this meal in haste, ready and waiting in confident expectation, prepared for our Lord's sudden return. Honoring his word, approaching his word daily as true and absolutely certain, fanning the flames of our hope until he come. But this is God's righteousness for us. Seek ye it first, for the calling and gifts of God are without repentance, and God, he cannot lie.